Okay, this is my lecture for Monday's class uh, at New Jersey City University. Um, oops. Let's start this up again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is World War One. So today I'll be introducing you to sort of outline of the war, and we'll see how much we can get through uh, before uh, I have to go. I'm recording in my hotel lobby, um, so you know. I'll try to limit it to 15 minutes or so, so I don't get ejected. Uh, and we'll talk more about this um, for Wednesday's class. Okay, so 1914 to 1918, the World at War. Uh, this is really the first conflict that could be called a world war. Um, because most of the fighting was in Europe, but um, as we discussed previously, Europe had collected a series of imperial colonies abroad, and when the European powers went to war, their colonies went to war with them. There's a few different viewpoints about how the war broke out, or what was the war goals. Uh, one was that this was a family feud. Uh, this was the prevailing view in America that Europe was essentially having a family feud, uh, cousins fighting each other sort of thing, and that America should keep out of it. Uh, the sense behind this was most of the royal families of Europe were actually related, um, and it was seen as a bit of a, a, you know, a family feud. Uh, the fall of the Eagles was another mindset, being that this was, you know, the old empires were, were coming to an end, um, and again, the U.S. should keep out of it. In Europe, um, it was this idea that this is a war to end all wars. That, you know, once this war was fought and, and ended, that then um, there'd be no need for, for any further wars. Uh, finally, um, toward the end of the war, the U.S. did enter uh, on the Allied side, uh, and they were now, after saying it was a family feud and fall of the Eagles, that sort of thing, that justify uh, U.S. involvement, so they decided that the mindset was this was a war to make the world safe for democracy, uh, being the democracies of Britain and France, as opposed to the uh, monarchies of German, Germany and the Austrian Empire. So some of the causes of the war. Um, this is very convoluted and confusing, so try to bear with me as I try to break them down for you. There was two alliance systems in Europe. Um, both of which were actually meant to prevent war. Uh, the idea is that these allied camps uh, would, war against one would mean war against the other. So generally they would keep out of war uh, for fear of bringing in uh, the other, you know, so France wouldn't attack Germany, for instance, knowing that uh, Austria, Hungary, and Italy would come to their, their aid, or um, Germany wouldn't attack Britain knowing that France and Belgium would come to their aid. So these were called alliance systems, and they were actually meant to prevent war, not lead to war. Uh, but it was a way of saying, you know, if we do go to war, you have you have my back, right? So there were two systems. One was the, the Triple Entente. Uh, this was the uh, led by France primarily. This was the European alliance system. Britain and France as the, the major partners with uh, Italy. I mean, I'm sorry, Italy, Belgium as um, another another partner. Uh, the Triple Alliance system had Germany as the major proponent, major player, with Austria-Hungary as uh, one of these old empires that had been declining but was still somewhat relevant, and Italy uh, initially. Once war actually broke out, Italy left the uh, Triple Alliance and joined the Triple Entente. Uh, and Italy's place in the Triple Alliance was taken by the Austro, I mean, by the Ottoman Empire. So these are some of the major players in the war. Um, okay, uh, up here we can see uh, Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia, uh, George V, the um, King of, of Great Britain. Uh, Victor Emmanuel, the Prime Minister of, of Italy, sorry, the King of Italy, and uh, Poincaré, who was the uh, President of France. In uh, For the Central Powers, 
which was what the tri Triple Alliance called itself once war broke out, uh, because Italy had left and joined the Allies. You have Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, um, Ebner Pasha, who was not the Sultan of Turkey, but was the Grand Vizier, uh, who was sort of leading the Turkish government. And down here his name is cut off, but this is Franz Joseph, who was the Emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And at the time the war broke out was, was well into his 80s. Uh, this is sort of a map of the battleground of, of Europe. Um, and this, again, is where most of the fighting was done, despite this being called a world war. So there's two main fronts, with a, a third sort of less important front here, and an even less important front in Italy. So there's the Eastern Front, which was mostly fought um, in kind of Eastern and Central Europe um, and Russia. Uh, initially, this was a Russian invasion of Germany that uh, went badly. Uh, Germany was able to, to regain their ground and start to push back Russia. Uh, Russian invasion of Galicia, which was the Polish part of Austria-Hungary, uh, also failed. And um, by, by about 1915, 1916, uh, they were pushed back to this line, and this was the armistice line uh, in 1917. Um, once the armistice was signed, uh, Russia was compelled under its new communist leadership to find, sign the Treaty of uh, Brest-Litovsk, uh, which granted the rest of the Baltic countries and the Ukraine to Germany. Uh, Germany was primarily looking for a breadbasket to feed their industrial economy uh, because they were cut off from uh, a lot of the colonial territories abroad and a lot of what it used to be German farmland uh, had become industry, so they primarily wanted a rural breadbasket which the Ukraine would provide. Um, and this whetted German appetites for what would eventually happen in World War II. Uh, in the Western Front, initially, Germany advanced uh, through Belgium, which didn't last very long, um, into France, and they got to the actually the outskirts of Paris uh, before the the attack failed, and uh, the French managed to push them back with British help to about this line, where it held for most of the war. Uh, there was a second German advance later, uh, this little bubble here, uh, which essentially then exhausted. Uh, German resources. Uh, the front in Italy was Italy tried to invade Austria-Hungary at first uh, failed uh, and Austria-Hungary actually managed to take some Italian territory but then the Italians began to push Austria-Hungary back and when the war ended uh, the line was about here. In the Balkans um, the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria who was an, another sort of junior partner in the central powers um, came to lead a, an invasion of uh, Romania um, and Serbia to aid the, their German allies after a, an Austro-Hungarian invasion of Serbia had failed. Um, Greece decided to declare for the allies, which meant that these powers tried to invade Greece, but um, luckily for the Greeks, uh, their country is very mountainous and the, the uh, central powers weren't able to make very very much progress. Uh, this is still primarily, you know, land-based warfare. Okay, so let's talk about militarism and the arms race. Um, this is total dispense expenditures uh, for the great powers in millions of pounds. And the reason we have pounds instead of dollars is um, that's the data available. I mean, we could translate it into dollars, but it's not going to be a one, you know, a one for one match. Because um, the exchange rates have fluctuated over time, so it's actually more useful to think of it in pounds. And this is the combined expenditures of the major powers, and this shows just how fast they were arming themselves. So you see uh, about 94 million pounds in 1870, up to um, you know more than double that 30 years later, uh, almost tripling really uh, by 1900, and by another. 15 years later, um, almost, you know, almost into the third added uh, on the eve of war. And this shows the percentage of budget that um, was increased to, to lead to defense expenditures. Britain and France, who probably weren't really preparing for war, uh, only about 10 and 13 percent. Uh, Russia and Germany that seemed to see war as imminent uh, were spending more money on on building up their armed forces. So you can see 
the both the increase in expenditures and the countries that were spending the most. Um, these show sort of the, the world war aspect of this war. So you can see the Entente, uh, which was these European powers uh, with Russia and um, their colonies abroad. So the, um, the British and French colonies in Africa uh, joined the war because they were British and French colonies. They didn't really have a say. The same with India uh, joined the war because uh, it was a British colony, didn't really have a say. Um, the, the French territories in uh, Southeast Asia likewise joined the war because they didn't have much of a choice because they were colonies, same with Australia. The German colonies are interesting. Uh, the German colonies in East Africa, they, um, these weren't very productive colonies for Germany, not very valuable, but Germany was actually able to recruit uh, a fairly large number of men to fight for the German cause, and for a while these colonies resisted uh, Allied attacks to Allied attempts to take them. Um, the German Pacific Islands, less so. Uh, Japan led an invasion of them, um, which you know enabled um, them to be knocked out of the war, and that was Japan's contribution on the Allied side. Later in the war. Um, the U.S. and Brazil joined the Allied cause about the same time in, in 1917. Um, aid from both countries took so long to reach Europe that the war, although it wasn't over, was essentially decided. Um, Saudi Arabia wasn't really a country, uh, it was just called Arabia, and it was really a collection of, of tribal societies. Uh, nonetheless, they led a resistance movement uh, among the Arabs in the Ottoman Empire against Ottoman rule, um, which eventually led to the liberation of, of most of the Arab territories. Uh, but liberation should belong in quotation marks, as although they were freed from Ottoman domination, uh, most of them passed under British or French domination. Uh, China also joined the Allied cause a bit later, um, mostly to attack the Japanese port, I mean the German port of, of Shintao. Um, they didn't really contribute much. It was more, you know, nominal allies than, than real allies. Uh, but just looking at the map, you can see why the allies won. They command far more territory, far more resources, you know, pretty much a foregone thing. All right, we're going to talk about nationalism as kind of my last thing, probably, before I let you go. Uh, I will resume, of course. Uh, on Wednesday. So you can see aggressive nationalism here uh, depicted by caricatures of the various powers of Europe. Um, so you can see uh, Germany here fighting a two-front war um, facing Russia who was seen here as the aggressor because they initially did attack Germany uh, being pushed back, you know, the German bayonet and the Russian nose. And you can see France here um, you know, in, in, at first in disarray uh, from German invasion, and the German gun pointed into Belgium. Uh, Austria-Hungary's focus is mostly east, trying to keep Russia out, um, with Italy kind of putting its nose uh, you know, up here. Um, and you can see the, the characterizations of the, the Balkan countries, uh, Greece and Turkey as well, uh, as well as Spain, who largely sat out of the war. Uh, in Britain represented by um, the bulldog, you know, always. Uh, another element to this nationalism was the um, nationalism in the form former Ottoman territories of the Balkans. Um, these territories, due to a legacy of uh, first Byzantine domination during the, me the medieval era and then Ottoman domination during the, uh, the post-medieval era, had considerable minorities, um, all of whom were, you know, spread about or intermixed with other populations. So you can see uh, Greece has, um, which only extends to here in this time period, uh, considerable uh, Albanian population, uh, Slavic minorities, and this group here, which were the remnants of um, a crusader occupation of Greece. These were a, a romance people who lived in Greece. Um, you can see the Macedonians as an independent group of Slavs who don't have their own country, and the Albanians who uh, aren't really Slavic. Um, they seem to be the remnant of a, a population that existed in pre-Roman times.